want to thank you all for tuning in to Black Video News. I'm Keith Scott. We've been making our discussion and dialogue around the community, also with the police brutality that's taking place throughout our country here. And we are having this discussion today with our own Bishop David Michael Copeland of New Creation Christian Fellowship right here in Wincrest, Texas. He's joining us. How are you doing today, Bishop? I'm blessed. How are you today? I'm doing good, sir. Bishop, I want to go right into it. Police brutality. What does a bishop, a pastor, tell his congregation and people in the community that you serve about police brutality? Be before I can address uh, police brutality, I have to give us a background on policing in America. Um, there are two streams of the origin of, of policing. One, in 1838, in the city of Boston, they established the first American police force. Um, that police force germinates out of um, an English model um, and somewhat of a log rolling model in America where neighborhoods would have like neighborhood watch. And so everybody um, took part in protecting one another's property and, and, and personhood. So you have, you have that stream, but then you also have the stream that in the early days of America, law enforcement uh, centered around slavery. Okay. And that the early militias, police forces, were those individuals who were responsible for recapturing and structuring um, slaves and they're keeping them quote unquote in line. Now, when you come to current policing, you have some police forces that see themselves as a part of the community and therefore uh, back in the day you would have police walking the beat. You would have police who indeed would um, know the neighborhood. They would know um, the, the, the businesses. They would know the children. They would know the individuals in the community. So that's, that's one model. Then you have the other model that if police saw themselves as those who were responsible to maintain law and order, who had to maintain the social, political structure, then they saw themselves as protecting the status quo and not necessarily being friendly to the people that they were covering. So uh, when, when you had patrols, when you had um, the, the slave patrols, they, first of all, you have to remember, slaves were not seen as people. Slaves were seen as objects and properties. Uh, the late Lucius Tobin, one of my professors at Colgate, said that African Americans had been thingified. So they were not seen as objects. So part of my question would be, when you're looking at police relationships with people, does the policeman see himself as a part of the community or one who is superimposed over the community who is supposed to maintain a certain status quo for the greater uh, community? Now, if you don't see me as human, if you don't see me as, as your equal. If you don't see me as a part of your family, your, the way you handle me is going to be differently than if you saw me as your nephew or your niece, your cousin, your brother, or your relative. And so um, I, I, much of that then has to do with how you see that. So when, when you have churches who have leaders that you have to ask the question, how do you see people? How do you see your members? How do you see society? So if you listen to leaders, political or religious, you, I'm suggesting that you listen to what is the underpinning of their argument. Do they see um, um, the community as a part of a family or do they see community individuals as people who work for a greater good or a greater, uh, a greater social, social order. And so out of that mindset, if I don't see you as human, it's okay for me to hit you over the head with a billy cup. 
If I don't see you as human, it's okay for me to pull you out of a car and six policemen beat you mercilessly and then get away with it. If I don't see you as human, I can see you putting a chokehold on me because I'm selling cigarettes, and if I die, I die. But if I am a part of the community, if I'm part of your family, when you roll up on me on the car and you ask me for my license, you are friendly to me because you're trying to assist me in obeying the law. But if you see me as something as other, then you come with your guns drawn and ready to take me out if I don't give you the proper response. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's, it's still that same mentality when we talk about that. So let's go to the core of the police department because the same structure, the same policies have been implemented, and that's what I'm hearing from you because they're using the same tactics. No, that no, here, 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 I want you to hear this. Depending on the perspective of the law enforcement community and how they see themselves in the community will regulate how they handle and how they deal with people in the community. For example, if uh, just, just the other day I, I, I'm getting off the plane and you have policemen um, who are patrolling or who are taking care of traffic, all right? Oh, 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 an Anglo person is waiting on the curb. The person picking them up pulls up in the middle of the thoroughfare and gingerly takes their time. They hug each other. They put the bag in the back. They drive off. Mm -hmm. An African-American person sitting on another African-American lady standing on the curb she gets ready to get in the car, and the police officer says, hurry up. Now, what, what, what's the difference? Same situation, same circumstance. The only thing that changed in the picture was who was trying to get into the car with their bags. When it was an Anglo person, mm -hmm. patience. Right. When it was an African-American woman and an African-American man, Hurry up and keep it moving. Right. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that what people bring to the table determines how they're going to handle every situation and circumstance that they face. And, 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 and so I don't know how you direct that. It begins with where your heart and your head is. It also begins with what has been handed down to you. Years ago, there was a study. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the persons was Greer. I forget the other one. They had done a study that when you, you, had, a, you had an Anglo mother with her daughter on an elevator, when, the, when another white man got on the elevator, the hands were calm and, and they greeted each other cordially. When a black man stepped on the elevator, she squeezed her kid's hand as though she was concerned about her safety. Well, that girl growing up has now has an impression. When I'm around white folks, I'm safe. When I'm around others, I need to be cautious. And, and so how do you address that? We, or, or, or how do you address um, in the last several elections... You have conservative pastors who would have attacked certain religious groups because they were not Christian. But when people from those religious groups now become candidates for the presidency, they would rather endorse what they call an other than Christian group over re supporting an African American. Yeah. How, how how do you address? In in my wife and I several times have been to South Africa. In South Africa, they have several museums and displays, and they found and we found that in South Africa under apartheid, that Africans always had to carry their birth certificate as a form of identification as to whether or not it was free. It was appropriate for them 
to be out in the streets. That that was road and, and apartheid in South Africa. Yes. We come to America and somebody wants to know where is your birthright president? It's the same, it's the same underpinning about how you see the others. Yes, yes. If I now you have to be careful. If everybody who doesn't agree with me, I can call out of their name and nobody corrects me on that. It's not just the person who's talking that needs to be addressed. It's the people who's listening that need to be addressed. And so so when you ask somebody, um, okay, we got two choices. We got somebody who has served in the government for 20, 30 years and done more for our nation. And you got another person who just who's only been looking out for themselves all their lives. Which do you, how do you make a choice? And, they, and the reason why it's 50, 50% in the polls is because I want to suggest that more people are akin to what people are being said than they're admitting. Right, right. But I, but I, I, I agree. We know we have a race issue in this country that needs to be dealt with. I want to shift gears real quick because how come we aren't hearing from the white evangelists throughout the country? What are they telling their congregations? Did you ever hear that someone says silence means consent? You ever heard that? Yeah, I've heard it before. Okay, what other what other question you want to ask me? Okay, let's go right into let's go right into the core of the police department, Bishop. How come how can we structure things different within the core of the police department when we talk about recruiting, when we talk about diversity? Because there has to be some type of diversity in these police departments where they're in predominantly African American have, have you, communities, especially communities that are socially economically have you ever hurting. Applied, have you ever applied for a job? All the time, okay. several times. When you when you apply for a job at a company, do they vet you? They vet you. They look at your resume. You come into an interview. They want to find out if your your mindset, your ideology is going to be compatible to the organization or the company you're trying to be hired by. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. So it doesn't make any difference to a large degree what your ethnicity is. What makes the difference is your mindset in you applying for those particular jobs. Again, if you see yourself in public service as a community representative versus a person who is being paid to uphold the status quo, you're going to approach your responsibilities in a different manner. Okay, okay. Well, Bishop, I want to thank you for taking the time out today to talk to us here. Uh, you want to leave us with something, Bishop, before we close out with this interview? My, my, my hope would be that in dealing with other people, that you have a, the choice to see the other person as a family member or as a foe. If you see them as someone that needs to be controlled, you will treat them one way. If you see them as someone who needs to be comforted and covered, you're going to see them in another way. Bishop, I wanted to ask you too also, from your perspective, um, what, what do we need to do as Christians to ease the pain with people that are hurting throughout our country with what's happening with police brutality and policing? Well, as a, as a bishop in the Lord's church, Part of my responsibility is not only to teach and to minister, but also to help to govern and to stand in counsel with what the church ought to do in this season. Um, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And so the question is, how do I see my service? If it is true, that um, all, at our core, what's important is what's in our heart. What comes out of our heart reflects the fruit of our life. And so my, my concern or my advice to pastors, to Christian leaders, 
to government people is that whatever we say, whatever we do, will be a reflection of what's in our heart. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus did not come to put our hands in check. He did not come to put our mouth in check. He came to put our heart in check. And so it's my prayer, it's my desire, that out of the heart of Christ, that if we are Christian, if we are believers, if we hold the, the, the biblical precedent to be our mandate, then greater love has no man than this, than he does what? Lay down his life for another. And so instead of being my self-interest, I think at some point we have to ask the body of Christ to be other interest. When, when uh, Paul uh, was in chains and, at, and he wrote in Philippians, he said, all this stuff has happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. So that he took a very negative situation and said, some kind of way God can use it so that we can promote the gospel to get it into areas that otherwise would not get it. If you understand, when he wrote that, the Praetorian Guard were the police force of that day. But as he was chained to them, they were chained to him. And as a result, the words he spoke, the lessons he taught, the communication he had was such that the Praetorian Guard who were Roman many of them walked out as Christians. And so my concern is that we in the body of Christ have the responsibility to help to transform lives through Jesus Christ. All right, well, thank you so much, Bishop. I wanna thank you. <laughs> I wanna thank you for taking the time out. This is Bishop David Michael Copeland in a discussion with what's going on throughout our country right here at New Creation Christian Fellowship in Wincrest, Texas. Keith Scott, Black Video News. <laughs>